In this video I will cover all of the separate only content for Biology Paper 2. So this paper has three topics. Topic 5 which is homeostasis and response. Topic 6 which is inheritance, variation and evolution. And topic 7 which is ecology. Compared with paper 1 there is a lot more separate only content for paper 2. You should know if you're doing separate science because you take the longer exams which are 1 hour and 45 minutes each. Topic 5 then will concentrate on the separate only topics which are the brain, the eye, the kidneys and plant hormones. You don't need to know about all the different parts of the brain but you do need to know about these three particular regions. The first one here is the large um, wrinkly area all around the top of the brain and that is called the cerebral cortex that has a number of functions um, and is responsible for things such as your language, your memory, your intelligence, um, your consciousness which is all the things that you are thinking about and this region here is called the medulla the medulla controls all of your unconscious activities which includes things like your breathing and your heartbeat so your breathing rate your heartbeat so you, if you think about it you breathe without even thinking about it and that is called um, controlled by the, the medulla region of your brain. The final region that you need to know about is this region at the back of the brain called the cerebellum. The cerebellum here is responsible for muscle coordination so in other words all of your movements So a lot of scientists have um, great interest in the brain because of the amount of processes that it controls. It's something that's quite difficult to study and it's an organ that is quite difficult to operate on and to fix. But there are several studies that people are doing to try and find out exactly what different regions of the brain are responsible for. For example, the cerebral cortex is a rather large part of the brain but people are trying to focus down particularly on the areas that are really involved in language or memory or intelligence, for example. And as far as the cerebellum is concerned, there are obviously reasons why people might want to look closer into that region and find out exactly how muscles are coordinated. So it can, can treat um, particular disease, disorders, perhaps paralysis and things like that. Scientists that study the brain are called neuroscientists. And over the years, they've had some clues as to what regions of the brain control certain um, aspects of a human's body. For example, if a particular region of the brain was damaged, and obviously damaged, then we can look at the effects of that. Perhaps um, they've gone blind or can't move a leg or have lost their memory or something like that. And then that can help us track which regions of the brain are responsible for certain disorders. We can also um, electrically stimulate the brain. And you may well have seen um, videos of this. Um, often people are conscious when these kind of things happen. So the electrodes going in, stimulating particular regions of the brain, observing the responses of those and trying to work out what different bits of the brain are responsible for certain functions in the body. Um, for example, if you put a, uh, an electrode in and you get a muscle twitch in your leg or in your um, foot, then you would know that that region of the brain is associated with some sort of muscular function in that part of the body. More recently, um, we've been able to advance our um, medical equipment and we use machines called MRI scanners so that we can take pictures of different regions of the brain. Um, this, for example, is an MRI image of the entire head. It can give a really detailed picture 
People can be um, active when they go into the MRI scanner. So that's one of those big tubes that you may well have seen um, videos or films of people laying down whilst they're still conscious and having images of their brains scanned. What that will do is it will help us work out whilst they're conscious um, what parts of the brain are controlling certain parts of the body. However, there are some disadvantages to all of this work on the brain. Um, for example, you can run the risk of physical damage if you're perhaps putting electrodes into someone's head or multiple MRI scans or whatever it is, you could cause more damage by trying to investigate the problem. However, um, there are obviously major advantages of this brain surgery because they can help treat or maybe even in the future cure particular disorders. Um, we know now that um, a lot of uh, work has gone into treating Parkinson's disorder um, and tracking the regions of the brain which are responsible for those tremors which cause people suffering from Parkinson's disease a lot of um, discomfort in their life. So advantage, major advantages in trying to find these regions of the brain and helping to cure them but obviously the brain being such a delicate organ you do risk physically damaging it and you do risk altering um, someone's speech or language or movement as a result of any brain surgery. So major benefits, but obviously, um, you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into these operations because of the risk of physical damage involved. We said before that homeostasis was maintaining a constant internal environment. And as part of homeostasis, we need to control our body temperature. And as humans, we control our body temperature at 37 degrees C. This is because this temperature is the optimum temperature for enzymes to work. Too hot above 37 or too cool below 37, our enzymes will not function properly and that will slow all of the chemical reactions in our body. So our body has automatic systems to maintain our temperature very close to that region of 37 degrees C. Our body temperature is controlled by the brain. We don't need to know whereabouts in the brain, but approximately here we've got a thermoregulatory centre. And this coordinates the response to any um, temperature changes in the, in the body, so we can call that the coordinator. Within this thermoregulatory centre, it has um, receptors which detect changes to our blood temperature. And also, as you probably know, our skin also contains receptor cells that detect changes to the temperature of the environment. So both of these things um, help to regulate our internal body temperature. So just recapping to the nerve pathway that might be involved in this process, if these receptor cells on our arm detect a decrease in temperature, they would send a signal to the sensory neuron and then to the CNS, the brain and the spinal cord, and this would involve the thermoregulatory centre here. Then that signal would be sent along a motor neuron to an effector. And that effector may well be a muscle or a gland. So this effector here could be a signal given uh, to a muscle or a gland. For example, a muscle um, could help your hairs stand up on your arm or a gland could perhaps be used in uh, the release of sweat. So if your body temperature becomes too low 
there are several mechanisms that your body can put into place to counteract this. First of all, you would stop sweating. You might shiver. Your hairs might stand up, for example, on your arms and on your legs. And what this is doing is it if your hairs are flat, it doesn't provide any insulation. But if your hairs then stand up, it um, traps a layer of air, which then provides insulation. So that helps then to warm up your body a little bit more. So traps air for insulation. And the final thing that might happen is a process called vasoconstriction. And in vasoconstriction, your blood vessels constrict and reduce the blood supply to the skin. So what it's doing there is really conserving um, all your major internal organs and reducing the blood supply to the outside of your body. So the blood vessels will constrict slightly, reducing the blood flow, um, and then that often causes perhaps the outer parts of your body to go a bit paler. On the other side, if your temperature is too high, as part of your nerve response, an effector might be a gland which causes your body to sweat more and through the evaporation of the sweat that will provide a cooling effect and will allow your temperature to return towards normal. As well as that, um, you will have your hairs lie flat and you will also have vasodilation which is the opposite of vasoconstriction where your blood vessels get slightly wider they dilate and by doing that they provide more blood to the skin and therefore the heat can then radiate out of your body and in that case you'll find your um, you can feel your hands getting a little bit more swollen. You might have um, felt that if you're ever in a, in a hot climate. You can feel your hands and your feet getting more swollen as more blood is directed to the skin and therefore heat can be lost by radiation out of the skin. This section is about the eye. You need to know a lot of the different parts of the eye and their functions, which is the jobs that they do. So to start off with, we'll have a look at the cornea which is the transparent front area of the eye. And what that does is it helps bend, or you should know this as refract, the light into the eye. The second part is the iris. This um, contains muscles that control the size of the pupil. Now this part here is the pupil, it's just the hole. The pupil here is sorry, the hole here is just called the pupil. And the iris on the outside controls how big that is. It controls the diameter of the pupil. The lens is an important part of the eye as it focuses light onto the retina at the back. So we'll be talking about lenses quite a lot as we go through. So that's a really important to the eye, part of the eye that focuses the light on the retina. It is the retina, which we'll talk about in a minute, that contains receptor cells that are sensitive to light intensity and colour. Ciliary muscles help control the shape of the lens, and these are small muscles here and here, and they work alongside the suspensory ligaments to help control the shape of the lens. So you can imagine the relaxing and contracting of the muscles, helping to change the shape of the end lens and therefore helping to focus the light onto the retina at the back. The sclera is the tough outer layer of the eye, which is purely for protection. 
and the retina is um, an area at the back of the eye that contains the light receptor cells and this is where the image, uh, image is formed. So these are sensitive to both light intensity and colour and that is the area of the eye where the image is formed and finally at the back of the eye you get an optic nerve and this carries the impulses from the retina to the brain. Next we're going to talk about accommodation which is changing the shape of your lens depending on whether you're looking at near objects or objects that are far away. So first of all let's look at the accommodation for near objects. So if you're looking at an object which was close up, to help focus on that object, these following things would happen. The ciliary muscles would contract. And don't forget these are these small muscles just here. So those would contract. The suspensory ligaments would loosen and those were just next to the ciliary muscles, just here. So these suspensory ligaments here would loosen. That causes the lens to become thicker and it strongly, that means it strongly refracts the light. Okay, so this lens here will become a nice thick lens helping the light to be refracted strongly so you can focus on near objects. The opposite to that then would be focusing on far objects. So the accommodation is changing the shape of the lens now for a, a distant object. And the opposite would happen, the ciliary muscles relax. The suspensory ligaments are pulled tight and the lens becomes thinner so it only slightly then refracts the light. And that helps us fo focus on objects that are far away. Some people have problem with their lenses in their eyes, which cause them vision defects, such as short-sightedness, otherwise known as myopia. People with short-sightedness can see near objects really well, but cannot focus well on distant objects. In short-sightedness, the image is created before the retina, in front of the retina, and that needs to be corrected. And it's caused by having a lens that is the wrong shape. It causes too much refraction, which means the, the rays of light are bent too much and the image is formed much closer than it should be. We need the image to be formed here, so long as a, a clear image is sent up to the brain. So to correct short-sightedness, we can use um, glasses and the lens that they must have must be a concave lens. So to correct this, you'd have to put the concave lens or the glasses in front of the eye and that would then help the image to focus rather than here but at the back of the eye on the retina where it's supposed to focus. The opposite condition is long-sightedness, otherwise known as hyperopia. People with long-sightedness are able to see distant objects but are unable to focus on near objects and in this case the image is formed behind the retina And this needs to be corrected so that the image is formed on the retina. So again, 
there's a problem with the lens and this lens is the wrong shape and it doesn't refract or bend the light enough so the, the rays of light don't meet on the back of the retina the image is formed beyond that so it's not focusing properly and it needs to be corrected it can be corrected by glasses and this time the glasses have to be convex lenses um, such as this shape if we were to put that in front of the eye as a person wore glasses that would help the light refract more and therefore the image will be created in the right place at the back of the retina. As well as glasses, in more recent years there have been improvements in technology which have brought about a variety of ways in which vision defects can be treated. So the obvious one is rather than glasses, a lot of people now are using contact lenses which act in the same way as glasses and help change um, the way that light is refracted into the eye and they're put directly onto the eye. Um, advantage of these, people find them a lot more um, convenient when playing sports and being active. Obviously running around with glasses on has its problems, they can fall off, they can smash, you can get injured um, if you're wearing glasses whilst you're doing sport. Um, but it does run the risk of infections as well. Um, a lot of people forget to take them out before they go to bed and end up with um, very dry eyes. It can cause infections with you keep putting your fingers in your eyes to replace the contact lenses, etc. They're really uh, lightweight now and comfortable. A lot of people prefer them to glasses because they they can't, um, they don't even notice that they're wearing them anymore um, and they do the same job as glasses do. Some people opt for a more daring approach and it's become a lot more popular in recent years and that's laser eye surgery. And in this, it's the thin, uh, it's the cornea layer, sorry, the transparent layer right at the front of the eye that is targeted in this surgery. And what the laser can do is um, remove tissue from the cornea. So it can adjust how much light is going in or out of the cornea by changing the thickness and that will help with changing the way in light is bent through the cornea, the way it's refracted through the cornea, um, and that can improve vision for some people. And the final one that people might opt for is actually replacement of their lens under surgery. So if you have a really, really bad problem with your vision, you can have your own lens removed and replaced with a uh, transparent uh, plastic lens. With this procedure, as it's a surgical procedure, it does also run the risk of infection and that's an increased risk because it's working at a level inside your body. Um, and also some people worry that it can cause further damage to your vision by having an operation on your eye. And that is also a problem with laser eye surgery as well. They run the risk there of further damage or irreparable damage due to um, somebody not applying the laser correctly or making a mistake during your surgery. One extra thing about the eye that links in with reflex responses is how the pupil in the eye responds to bright light and also will look at dim light as well. So within the uh, coloured part of the eye, within the iris, you've got two sets of muscles. You've got circular muscles and you've also got radial muscles that are a bit like radius, that might help you remember it. So here we have the radial muscles and we've got the circular muscles and these control the size of the pupil. So in bright light you need to shut your eye very very quickly otherwise the eye can damage, the light sorry, can damage your retina. So what happens in bright light is the pupil wants to get uh, really smaller very quickly. So it is a reflex response and the three R's might help you remember what happens. So in this reflex response the radial muscles relax, three R's, 
and the circular muscles contract and that makes the pupil really small. The opposite happens in dim light. So in dim light you get your radial muscles contracting and you get your circular muscles relaxing and that makes the pupil really big. The kidneys are organs that play an important role in maintaining the water and ion balance within the body and also removing a substance called urea which is produced by the body and together a balance of water, ions, urea and other substances is called urine which is produced by the kidneys and removed from the body. Why it's important to make maintain this water and ion balance is so that the correct osmotic balance is maintained within the body. We know from a previous topic that osmosis is the movement of water molecules from where there is a high concentration of water molecules to a lower concentration of water molecules. Or you may well have learnt it from a dilute solution to a more concentrated solution. I'm also going to put some ions in here as well because they're important too. So in our body we have a mixture of water and ions and these can move in and out of cells. Water of course moves by osmosis and ions might move by active transport or diffusion. The cells in our body maintain a particular shape and they need a certain amount of water in there to do their functions. If the osmotic balance changed outside of the cells you may either see water moving out of the cells which will cause a problem. If there is a net movement out it will cause the cells to not have enough water they may shrivel a little bit and they won't be able to perform their functions properly. Alternatively, the osmotic balance could shift so that water moved into the cells, causing too much water to move in, um, perhaps could cause the cell to rupture, um, and it would not be able to um, perform its function. So maintaining this osmotic balance within our bodies is really, really important. There are a number of ways in which we um, remove water from the body. So water can be removed naturally and we don't have control over this but through the lungs and through sweating and we have no control over how much is lost by those means. Ions um, are things that you can take into your body through your um, uh, through digestion so they're things like sodium ions, magnesium ions and things like that and they too are lost through sweat and finally urea is a substance that is produced by the body and this can also be lost through sweat as well. However where these um, mechanisms aren't properly controlling the amount of water, ions and urea that we need in our body, that's where the kidneys come in. Because they can um, control the amount of water that is lost through our uh, kidneys, helping maintain the water balance. This has control over the ions that are lost through urine and also it can help remove any excess urea. So where is these functions we don't have control of, our kidneys um, do control the amount of water, ions and urea that is lost through urine. So there's two processes as to how the kidneys work. The first one is filtration and this does what it says on the tin, it filters the blood. So as the blood travels through the kidneys it is filtered and things such as um, ions, urea, glucose, 
etc. are removed. However, you may not be in a position where you want all of those ions, urea, glucose, water, etc. removed and you may want to put some back into the blood and that's where step two comes in. After filtration, there's a process called selective reabsorption whereby some of these things, if necessary, are put back into the blood in the correct amounts. That's why there is called selective reabsorption. So some substances are put back into the blood. As we said before, to maintain the osmotic balance, you wouldn't want to remove all of the water or all of the ions, for example, but you'd want to remove a certain amount so that the osmotic balance is maintained, and then the rest you'd want to put back into the blood. And the result of that would be that you produce urine, which would contain water, glucose, ions, urea, etc. Just in addition to that, we said that the kidneys are evolved involved in the removal of urea and you need to know a little bit about where that comes from. When you digest protein, your body breaks that protein down into amino acids which are used for growth and repair. However, excess amino acids not used by the body need to be removed. And to help remove them, in the liver, there's a process called deamination, which you don't need to know in a lot of detail, you'll just need to perhaps recall the name. But what that does is it breaks down the amino acid and produces ammonia. However, there's a problem with that. Ammonia itself, being in the body, is toxic. Therefore, straight away, it's converted into urea. And then that can be removed by the kidneys. For patients suffering with kidney failure, one option is for them to regularly use a dialysis machine. So this could mean them visiting the hospital three to four um, times a week and they would be attached to a machine for several hours. How the machine works is very similar to how a kidney works in that blood is taken out of a person and fed into a machine. The blood is fed through an area of the machine which has a partially permeable membrane and then the blood returns back into the person. At this point here where you've got a partially permeable membrane that means it is selective to the molecules that can go out of the blood into another part of the machine. And at this point here surrounding the partially permeable membrane is dialysis fluid. This fluid has very similar properties to blood and it has the ideal concentrations of water and ions in the blood. So what happens as the blood flows through the machine out of the person, it will enter this partial, partially permeable region and at this point substances such as urea, excess ions and water will leave the machine and much larger molecules like proteins will stay in the blood just like it would in the kidney. So this allows the blood to be cleaned even when the patient has um, a failing kidney. But this has to be done quite regularly so every sort of Three, three to four times a week they might have to go to hospital for several hours which will obviously affect their ability to work and lead a normal life 
um, they're attached to the machine, the, their blood is cleaned and filtered and put back into their systems. But it is, it's quite um, a long process, it's not a cure. It won't cure the kidney disease, it will only help to clean the blood and give them a better quality of life whilst they wait for an organ donor. So that's the other option that they can do, either um, put themselves on a, or the doctor put them on a waiting list for an organ donor, either that can come from someone who has died and is on the organ donor register, so is, is opted at their point of death to offer any of their organs to be used for other people, or it could be a living donor. With this though, obviously there is a, um, a slight risk to the donor because they have to undergo a procedure to have their kidney removed. And you can live with one kidney, but you just need to live more of a careful lifestyle and, and think about the things that, that you are eating and the, and the lifestyle that you are living. Um, there are long waiting lists for both of them. And, but in the long term, it is cheaper to um, go through an operation and provide someone with a, a donated kidney rather than spending a lot of money regularly for them to um, be attached to the dialysis machine to clean their kidneys, to clean their blood, sorry. As part of the higher tier only content for separate science, you need to know how hormones are involved in controlling water levels. Well, the master gland, the pituitary gland, is again involved in this process. The pituitary gland produces a hormone called ADH. And this hormone helps regulate the permeability of the kidney tubules, which is a part of the kidney. And by permeability, we mean how much water can leave the kidney and go back into the blood. So if the body were to detect that the blood was too concentrated, in other words, not enough water was in the blood, it would want the kidneys to release more water back into the blood. So to do that, what it would do was the pituitary gland would release ADH into the bloodstream. That would then cause the kidneys to release more water into the bloodstream because it would increase the permeability of the kidney tubules and more water would be released or reabsorbed into the bloodstream and that helps the body then maintain the balance of water within the blood and this is again a negative feedback system whereby if the levels of water in the blood go either above or below normal the negative feedback system will ensure that the um, water levels in the blood are returned to normal. For example, if there was too much water in the blood, at this point here the ADH would be inhibited. That will help it bring back to normal, but if there's not enough water in the blood, at this point here ADH would be stimulated to help bring the levels back to normal. first plant hormone we're going to talk about is auxin and auxin is involved in the growth of the plant. It has different effects whether you're talking about auxins in the root or auxins in the shoot of the plant. So the shoot of the plant is the bit that grows um, upwards out of the seed. If we have this as a seed, shoot would grow upwards and um, come out of the ground and the roots would stay below the ground. Auxin in both is produced in the tips of the root 
and the shoot. However, in the, in the shoot, the presence of the auxins stimulates growth. So where there is more auxins, there is more growth. However, in the root, the auxins inhibit, which means stop growth or slow growth. So in the root, where there are more auxins, there is going to be less growth. This helps us then explain a concept called phototropism, whereby plants respond to light. And auxins are responsible for how plants can bend towards the light. So for example, if I draw a very um, basic shoot, and if I put over here the light source, we know that that shoot will bend towards the light so it can get the maximum light intensity possible for photosynthesis. But you need to be able to explain exactly how it does that. So we said before that the auxins are produced in the tip of the plant, these are hormones. And what happens in response to light is the auxins move to the shady side. As we said before, auxin stimulates growth in the shoot, so now we will get unequal growth rates and we will get the plant on the left hand side here, in the shady side, growing more than the other side, which then will cause the shoot to bend over towards the light. So the main points that we need to put are the auxin collects on the shady side, that auxin stimulates growth, and that there are unequal growth rates, which means on the left and right hand side they grow at different rates. That results in the plant or the shoot bending towards the light. A second concept that you need to be aware of is gravitropism, otherwise known as geotropism. You can use either word in the exam. And this is the, the plant responding to gravity. And for this example, I'm going to draw a seed on its side with a shoot and a root. So I'll just put here so we um, remember them, shoot and as we said before, the auxins are produced in the tip of the shoot and the tip of the root. But because it's laid on its side, the auxins collect on the lower side and they have different effects whether we're talking about the shoot or the root. As we said before, in the root, in the shoot, sorry, growth is stimulated, therefore there'll be unequal growth rates the lower side of the leaf, the cells will grow and elongate more and you'll get more growth on this side compared to this side and therefore you will get the shoot moving upwards. So again, the same kind of things, the idea that it stimulates the growth in the shoot, you must include the, the phrase unequal growth rates due to the fact that there is unequal distribution of auxin And that leads to the lower side growing more than the upper side and the shoot grows outwards. However, despite the auxin collecting in the similar place on the root, if you remember from before, in the root the auxin inhibits growth. So this time there will be less growth on the lower side and more growth on the upper side. So you'll find that the root grows more on the upper side, less on the lower side, and therefore you get it growing downwards into the soil. And that's exactly what you want. When you have a seed laying on its side, you want the shoot to respond to gravity and move upwards, 
and likewise with the root, you want that to be going downwards. Because of auxin's role in the growth of plants, it has many uses commercially. First of all, um, auxins are used as a weed killer. When you're growing crops, you often have thin-leaved plants and you want to maximise the yield of your crop and you want as many, as much space as possible for your crop to grow. However, if you have um, weeds in there, they tend to be round leaf or broad leaf weeds, they, those can be selectively removed using a weed killer because the weed killer with auxins will target the broad leaf plants And that would mean that if you spray the weed killer on here, these would be killed and you'd end up with your um, crop being left and having more space to grow. So it selectively targets the broad leaves, but obviously if you're spraying it on a large area of land, you are going to reduce the biodiversity in that area because you are only leaving your crop species that you want. So that can have a negative effect as well. You can also use auxins as a rooting powder. When you um, take a cutting from a plant, for example, a small stalk with a few leaves on, it is possible to grow a whole plant from that cutting. If you were to put that in a pot of soil, however, it is very unlikely to grow. However, if you use auxins and as a rooting powder and before you put it in, if you cover the bottom section with rooting powder, then place it in your pot, that then stimulates the growth of roots. And you'll end up having lots of roots grow and you will end up with a whole new plant growing from just that cutting. And the final one, which is, is linked into this idea of the rooting powder, um, auxins are also used in tissue culture. And this is a very similar process, um, but you're growing clones of your plants. This comes up in the cloning topic a little bit later on. And to do that, you would put your um, plant material in a Petri dish and you would grow that Inside you would have some growth medium and that growth medium will contain auxins obviously to stimulate the growth of the clone plant in that tissue culture and that will then stimulate the cells to divide and grow into new plant tissue. Okay, here's two more plant hormones that we need to know about, and they're called gibberellins and ethene. Ethene is a hormone that's produced naturally by, by plants, and it promotes fruit ripening. So this is something that has been found to be useful commercially. For example, when you buy, uh, when you harvest a banana, they'll be green. But by the time they go into the supermarket, you want them to be ripe and ready to eat. So if you package that banana into a plastic bag, and if you pump into that plastic bag ethene, what that will do is during transport, the banana will ripen. So by the time it comes into the supermarket, your banana is a nice yellow colour ready for you to eat. So they'll do that with a lot of um, food products. Alternatively, they might want the opposite if they um, want to preserve the um, banana in a green state and if they don't want it to ripen, they'll perhaps have the reverse effect where they'll have a little pump making sure any ethene produced by the plant is removed from any packaging. However, this is the more common um, thing that the, the um, plant growers and transporters would want because they have to come a long way. They'd want the fruit to be ripening when it reaches the supermarket and not ripening and going off during transport. Gibberellins have a number of uses. They're really important um, for 
horticulturalists and um, garden centres and people wanting to grow and sell plants. One of the things they are useful for is they um, this hormone, gibberellin, can end seed dormancy. Now with seeds, they tend to have a very specific time that they will um, start germinating and growing and producing a plant. And the rest of the time they are sitting, laying dormant, waiting for the right conditions, whether it's temperature or humidity or whatever it is, they'll wait for the right conditions to grow. However, with gibberellins we can stop that dormancy and encourage this plant to germinate and grow into a seedling and then a fully fledged plant. So this is important, this is why when you go around um, garden centres you will see plants there all year round and perhaps actually normally their natural cycle would only be um, once, once a year in a very specific time frame. However if the gibberellins are used with the plant then that can end the seed dormancy and you can promote the growth at any time. The second thing it can do is promote flowering. So again a similar effect really if you've got a plant there that would normally um, flower in a particular time of year and you wanted to sell that plant or you wanted it to be on show um, to everyone a bit at a particular time, you can use gibberellins then to promote the growth of that flower at a time where it wouldn't probably be usually um, ready to show. The final thing that they can do, which is really useful, is it is it can be used to increase fruit size, which is obviously important when you're trying to make money out of growing fruit crops. So in large greenhouses and things like that, they might treat the plants with gibberellins to maximise the size of the fruit that is produced. We are now going to discuss a required practical, which is for separate scientists only. It's quite a simple required practical. Um, it wants you to investigate the effect of light or gravity on growth of plant um, and one suggestion might be for example that you have a petri dish or maybe three petri dishes and you make sure the conditions are same in all of them so the same water level, the same type of seed, the number of seeds etc. So on these petri dish you normally put a piece of um, cotton wool at the back bottom that's enough to grow um, crest seeds, damp cotton wool, but you might talk about soil at the bottom or something like that. You then place on top of that for example 10 crest seeds, I'm just going to do 5, equally spaced out and you would change a condition light or gravity, that, that one's quite difficult, I'll come on to this one in a minute, but you might can change the light conditions so you might for example for this one have the light source going straight down on the plant. For this one you might have the light source at an angle, like so, or you may well have change the light intensity, maybe change the power of the light bulb that you're using um, to see the effects that that has on the growth of plants. The important thing that they might talk to you about is control variables, because it's important that you keep a number of things the same. So like we discussed, the type of the seed that you're using, the number of seeds that you're using, the spacing of the seeds, otherwise competition might become a factor. Things like your water, your temperature. You shouldn't just put water actually, you should put volume of water. Um, and all those things that they might keep the same. So just bear in mind um, those control variables are important to show that growth um, is determined by the light, the effect of light, and not any of these other factors. Then you would leave the seeds to grow. And in this example, you would have uh, the seeds here growing straight upwards. These ones would respond to the light. 
and you need to be able to do a number of things. You need to be able to draw detailed drawings of your results. And you will also need to measure the length of your shoots. Okay, so nice easy experiment, setting up seeds, controlling the conditions and changing either light or gravity. So to show the effect of gravity um, instead of light, if, if you wanted to do that, or they might bring that up in the exam, you could perhaps have one pot with your seeds on facing upwards. You could have one pot with your seeds on facing one direction and then the other. And then you would observe the growth of the plants. Obviously with this one we'd expect them to grow upwards and with these ones we expect them to have a little bend and then grow upwards as well. And again you'd need to make detailed drawings of these, measure the length and control um, all the suitable conditions. For example the light intensity, um, the direction of the light, the uh, type of seed that you're using, the number of seeds etc to show that these, uh, this growth is due to the effect of gravity and not anything else. Topic six is inheritance, variation and evolution. And the separate only content includes more detail on DNA structure and how proteins are made. A little bit more about the differences between asexual and sexual reproduction. Um, some work on some quite influential scientists, including Mendel, who did work on genetics, and Darwin, Wallace and Lamarck, who published theories about evolution. And finally, um, you need to know about how animals and plants can be cloned. For separate science, you need to know a little bit more detail about the structure of DNA and protein synthesis. First of all, you need to know that the um, DNA polymer is made out of complementary base pairs, whereby A complements T and can be matched together and C and G are complementary base pairs. For example, here you've got C matching up against G and A matching up against T. You also need to know that the, um, the strand is made up of a sugar phosphate backbone. So you might see pictures of it that show a phosphate molecule attached to a sugar. And you need to know that it is the base that attaches to the sugar part and not the phosphate. So this would be the phosphate, sugar and the base. This together we call a nucleotide. So you need to describe the DNA as a polymer that can be made up of four different nucleotides. We said before that a particular sequence of DNA can code for a gene, which will code for a specific um, sequence of amino acids, which will then code for a particular protein. But further to that, there is also non-coding DNA. Quite a lot of the, the genome is non-coding DNA. And amongst other things, it is evolve, involved in switching on and off genes. So what proteins can we make from the DNA that is present in, in our cells? Well we can make hormones, we can make enzymes, and we can make structural proteins, for example um, something like collagen. But for separate science you also need to know a little bit more detail about the process that gets you from the um, genetic information that is held within the DNA molecule and to making a very particular protein. And the first thing that you need to know is that whilst you've got a long sequence of DNA bases, it is just three bases that codes for a particular amino acid. So when we get to the ribosome in a minute, this sequence is red in threes. 
and that will code for a particular amino acid, of which we said before there are 20 different amino acids. But the problem is, the DNA cannot leave the nucleus. So what happens is, inside the nucleus, an mRNA strand is made, which is a template of the DNA. Okay, so this bit happens within the nucleus of the cell. And then this mRNA strand can leave the cell and that can go to the ribosomes, and that is where pro protein synthesis happens. It happens at the ribosomes within the cytoplasm. And here at the ribosome, the um, mRNA template is, is read in threes again, and we said that each three bases will code for a particular amino acid. So when the, the three bases is read, a particular carrier molecule will bring that specific amino acid to the chain. You only need to know it as a carrier molecule in your, in your exam, although you may well have researched it as tRNA. But that will bring a very specific amino acid to your chain, and that will peel off and start to make a long chain protein, a long sequence of acids, uh, amino acids, sorry, which will make your protein. So this protein will eventually fold up and have a very particular shape with a very specific active site and as we said before this could be a hormone, an enzyme or perhaps some kind of structural protein. To go from that step of starting off with a very particular sequence of DNA to create a very specific sequence of amino acids and then to create a very specific protein with an active site of a particular shape you need all of the DNA to be correctly um, copied into mRNA and correctly read at the ribosomes however occasionally there are mutations that occur with the DNA. So perhaps something like ionizing radiation might cause this base to change. And that can cause problems because it can change the shape of the active site, which means that the protein will no longer work. Most mutations that occur won't have a significant effect on the protein, so it may just change it slightly, maybe not even in the active site region, perhaps around here, a slight change which will not affect the function of the protein. However, occasionally mutations can cause massive trouble. They can cause inherited disorders, um, such as cystic fibrosis. There are three different kinds that you need to know about. One of those are insertions, with an insertion, an extra base is added. And the trouble is with this, it has knock-on effects for all of the amino acids and therefore the structure of the protein later on. For example, if you had a particular sequence of bases in your gene, an insertion would mean an extra base is added to that sequence. For example, rather than starting TA, we could say that an extra T has been inserted into the sequence. But the reason this causes knock-on effects is because if you remember, each three bases um, codes for a particular amino acid. So by changing the sequence of codes here, you are going to end up coding for a different amino acid and this will happen all along the chain. So our first two were TAG, CGA, which would have coded for two particular amino acids, but the insertion has caused us now to read TTA, GCG. So this will affect the amino acids and therefore affect the shape of the protein that's made. The second one is similar, and that is a deletion. So the opposite, this time 
the base is deleted. But in the same way, it can have knock on effects down the whole uh, chain of bases. This will affect the amino acids and therefore the proteins that are made. So rather than inserting a gene this time, sorry, inserting a base this time, we might have, for example, this A disappear and we'll end up with a sequence TGC. G A T. And at that point, again, we've got different sequences of bases, therefore different amino acids are going to be made and the protein is going to be different. The final one is a substitution. And with this one, it only affects one amino acid. It could have a detrimental effect to the whole protein. Um, if it's in an important place or does an important role in the protein, but it only affects one amino acid. So if we start again with the sequence on the left, this time we're just going to substitute A for another base, so we might end up with something like T C G C G A T, and this time only this amino acid is affected, and you can see the other one is the same as before the mutation. For separate science, you need to know a little bit more detail about sexual and asexual reproduction. The main reason that sexual reprodu reproduction is advantageous is because it allows for variation in the offspring. That means not all the offspring are identical. For example, if you look at the two populations we've got below, this population of organisms um, has variation within it. They're all different shapes and sizes, so they could be a product of sexual reproduction, whereas these are all um, the same shape and size, so these could be a product of asexual reproduction. The problem comes in then is if the conditions in the environment change and being this shape is no longer advantageous, then you could see an extinction of the whole population if the organism reproduced only by asexual means. However, because of the variation in sexual reproduction, it could be that some of the organisms died out and only those that were shaped with an advantage for the environment survived. But that therefore is an advantage to the whole population because it ensures the survival of the population due to the variation that are in the offspring. This will then lead to, of course, survival of the fittest and natural selection whereby the organisms that have survived will pass on their favourable genes to the next generation. There are a few advantages of asexual reproduction also. Um, only one parent is needed so often this process is a lot faster. There's no need to find mates so less energy is used or needed for this um, asexual reproduction. And also if the conditions are favourable then many offspring can be produced so this can be a very quick process producing large numbers of offspring. There are some organisms that can use both methods so sometimes they can reproduce sexually and sometimes they can reproduce asexually. For example, the protists that are carried by mosquitoes will produce sexually inside the mosquito, but because it wants to replicate rapidly, it will reproduce asexually inside the host, for example, a human host. Many uh, funguses will also produce uh, both sexually and asexually depending on the advantage to them within the particular conditions of the environment. For example, if they needed to produce many offspring quickly and the conditions were suitable, they would reproduce asexually, but they also have the opportunity to reproduce sexually as well. And finally, lots of um, plants can do this as well. 
for example, plants that produce bulbs or runners, these this would be the, the form that they would reproduce asexually sexually in to produce a clone of each other. For example, um, daffodil bulbs producing a clone of the daffodil or strawberry runners producing a clone of the strawberry plant, but they can also reproduce sexually as well. Mendel, uh, Mendel's work really focused on how plant characteristics were passed on between different generations and his work was in the mid 1900s and at that point they didn't know about genetics, they didn't know about chromosomes, they didn't know about genes. So what Mendel did is he looked at different characteristics such as flower colour, such as the height of the plant or the characteristics of the peas, whether they were wrinkled or whether they were green or, or yellow, whatever he was looking at. And he did two crosses. The first cross that he did was between two purebred parents. So you can see here we've got a homozygous dominant and a homozygous recessive. And that um, combination left him with all red flowers, for example. But he then did a second cross and he then found out that he had a ratio of 3 to 1 where he had some white flowers coming back into the offspring in this second generation that he had not seen in the first cross that he had done. So using this work he repeated it again and again and again, looked at lots of different characteristics. He came up with the idea that there were hereditary units passed on from each parent. And we now know that these hereditary units are called genes, but at that time information about chromosomes and genes and DNA wasn't known. And he also um, found out that these hereditary units were either dominant or recessive. So really within the mid 1900s he had uh, the major foundations behind genetics and he is now well renowned for his work on genetics even though at that time a lot of the information that would help him understand his work wasn't available. Three scientists that you need to know about in relation to evolution are Darwin, Wallace and Lamarck. Starting off with perhaps the most famous one, that is Charles Darwin. He proposed the theory of evolution by natural selection. And actually this theory was proposed by and worked on by a number of different scientists. One of those is Wallace that we'll look at later. But at the time that Darwin was working, there were a lot of scientists going around the world, just like Darwin was, collecting lots of different evidence and data, looking at fossils and rocks and things like that, to develop his theory. So what this theory said was, first of all, there's natural variation of a characteristic within a population. So, for example, if we had um, some sheep, there would naturally be some sheep that have a particularly thick wool compared to to other sheep. So if we see here this sheep has got quite a thin wool, this one's got quite a thick wool, a thick coat. So there'll be natural variations, some will be a little bit shorter, a little bit thicker than others. And the individuals that are most suited to their environment are more likely to survive and breed. So this is the idea of survival of the fittest. So for example, if we were talking about a cold environment, you can imagine that a, a sheep with a particularly thick coat, a thick layer of wool, would be able to survive because they're better suited to the environment and they would be able to breed. And gradually over time, these, uh, these particular individuals would be more successful than ones with shorter coats. And when these breed, these characteristics are passed on to the next generation. So this is the theory of evolution by natural selection and eventually this population of sheep would evolve to have thick coats because those are the ones that are better suited for the environment. So Darwin spent years travelling around the world collecting evidence to support this theory 
And he did a little bit of work with Wallace that we'll talk about in just a minute. And this culminated in his book that he published in 1859, which was called On the Origin of the Species. However, the idea of evolution that was published in this book was very, very controversial at the time. Lots of people, including scientists, weren't in agreement with Darwin's theory. One reason why it clashed with some people is due to religion. So a lot of people believed that God created all animals and plants, so that didn't fit with his theory of how these animals and plants evolved over hundreds of thousands and millions of years. Secondly, although he did collect lots of evidence from around the world, there were still lots of gaps um, that in his evidence that didn't explain his theory fully, so there was insufficient evidence to support his ideas. And one of the main reasons was that the mechanism of understanding inheritance um, was not known at the time. So understanding of how characteristics were inherited was poor. So it wasn't until really the work of Mendel, which we talked about in, in earlier, um, did we understand that how characteristics were inherited. Mendel thought they were um, particular units that were inherited and that later on turned out to be particular genes. But at the time, this understanding wasn't there. So Darwin came up with this theory, but there wasn't a full understanding about how these characteristics were being passed on. So Wallace then. Alfred Wallace was around at the same time as Charles Darwin and look at the theory that he came up with. He came up with the theory of evolution by natural selection and that's no coincidence that that's exactly the same as Charles Darwin because Alfred Wallace independently came up with the same theory as Charles Darwin and actually they collaborated together and talked to each other about their ideas concerning this exact same theory. And in 1858, which was a year before On the Origin of the Species was released, um, they actually published joint work on their thoughts on the theory of evolution. So he published joint work with Darwin. However, when Alfred was then going around the world collecting other pieces of evidence, Charles Darwin the next year create, uh, published his full book of all of his thoughts and ideas. However, they did work together in 1858 and published their um, shared ideas together. Alfred Wallace is well known for um, two strands of uh, science within this theory of evolution by natural selection. He worked particularly on warning colorations in animals and the advantages that they have. So particularly bright coloured animals and how they are warning off predators, etc. And he also did a lot of work on how evolution led to speciation and new species of animals and plants. The third scientist that um, published ideas on evolution around the same time was John Baptiste Lamarck. And his idea on evolution was very different to that of Darwin and Wallace because he thought that changes that occur in an organism during its lifetime can be inherited. So what he thought happened was that if a giraffe throughout its lifetime grew to have a very tall neck, he thought that those tall neck giraffes could then pass those uh, characteristics for a tall neck onto their next generation. So he thought they changed throughout their lifetime and then passed that on to their offspring. Now, most of our evidence now suggests that this isn't the case and in fact you can't change during your lifetime and then pass on those characteristics to your offspring. And our evidence favours the evolution through natural selection proposed by Darwin and Wallace. Cloning is the process by which cells are replicated to produce identical copies and this can happen in both plants and animals. First of all, if we look with plants, there are two main ways that plants are cloned. The first is tissue culture. This is often used commercially to 
grow lots of plants obviously because they're cloned they would be all identical so you'd pick your best plants for tissue culture or they can be used um, by conservationists to try and preserve rare plants if you only have a few individuals of an organism left you might want to take some cells away from that and make clones of that particular plant so the way they do that is they just remove a few cells from the leaf so just um, scrape the leaf to remove just a few cells and then they are put onto a growth medium and they are left to grow and because most plant cells differentiate throughout their lifetime they will grow and differentiate into a fully cloned plant often they'll be taken from the the meristem tissue where there are lots of undifferentiated cells alternatively because lots of uh, plant cells can differentiate throughout their lifetime um, it can be done on a lower level in your garden so obviously you won't have access to very special growth medium or things like that but you can quite simply take a cutting of a plant so perhaps take a small bit of leaf or maybe a leaf and a little bit of the stem and you can grow that in compost and that for the, for the majority of plants will grow into a brand new plant. It won't work with all of them um, but if the cells can differentiate they'll start to grow roots and grow into a, its own plant in its own right, obviously identical to its parent plant. To help the roots grow often the rooting powder containing growth hormones, auxins, are added um, to help those roots grow as well. Obvious advantages then is that we can help protect rare plants or we can grow lots commercially. Um, if we've got a really good plant, we can, with producing lots of flowers for example, or lots of fruit, we can clone that um, and produce lots more. The main disadvantage is, it disadvantage is that it reduces the gene pool. So because you're using a, a clone, you're I, you're having identical genes in the next generation, the next generation and so on. So these can um, reduce the variation within the genes which makes it susceptible to more um, disease and things like that because you don't have that vari variation and the ability to of plants to adapt. Animals can also be cloned. Um, so the first way that we'll discuss is cloning straight from an embryo. So at this stage here this embryo is made up of undifferentiated cells so what you can actually do is split the embryo at a very early stage and because the cells are undifferentiated actually you will create two clones of the same embryo which you can then implant into an animal for example if this is a sheep animal rather than having one offspring you can have two identical offsprings if we put these into different mothers like so kind of looks like a sheep not really um, if we put those into different mothers they will produce the same identical offspring because all we've done is we've got the embryo here which is a group of cells right at the beginning of life we split that and that will start dividing into two um, individuals they will be absolutely identical because they'll be clones of each other and we put them straight into a host mother who will bear the child the other way that you can clone an animal is through adult cell cloning and because it's an adult cell you're taking the DNA from a developed cell a differentiated cell and then you are going to use that to make your cloned organism so you start off with two cells. One is an unfertilized egg cell. So with this cell, we just need an egg cell for the um, process of cell division to be able to start later on. So what we do is we remove the nucleus because we don't want this DNA. We just want the empty egg cell. And we take another cell, which is an adult cell, for example, a skin cell containing the uh, the DNA that we want to clone. So for example if this was a skin cell of our prized sheep and we wanted to clone our sheep we would take the skin cell from our sheep and we would take an unfertilized egg cell from another sheep that's just going to be our carrier. So what we don't want this time is we don't want the rest of the cell 
we just want the DNA within the nucleus. So we take the nucleus out of that cell and then we fuse them together. So we've got our egg cell with the DNA that we want now inside it. And if this starts dividing, this will turn into an embryo. So to do that, we need to give it an electric shock just to stimulate the cell division. And after that electric shock, it will start dividing and again and so on and so forth until we have this embryo which is our ball of cells which we'll be, we will then put into our host mother. So this way um, we're going to produce a clone which is identical to the animal with which we've retrie retrieved the skin cell from. It won't be identical to the host mother Okay, this is just the, the mother that's going to carry that embryo. It'll be identical to the animal from which we have removed the skin cell. The separate only content for Topic 7 Ecology um, includes information about decay. Um, this includes a required practical that is separate only. Um, some information about trophic levels and biomass linking into food chains and also um, work on food security and food production. The process of decay is whereby microorganisms such as um, bacteria or fungi or they could just be really small um, microscopic creatures are feeding upon um, organic waste and organic matter for example plants and animals that have died and by doing that they recycle the waste and it can be used for things such as compost there are very particular conditions that are needed for decay for these microorganisms to respire. So normally decay will happen in aerobic conditions, so things such as worms are really good for creating channels in the soil for air to get in to allow um, oxygen in and decay to happen. So normally it happens in aerobic con conditions and these microorganisms break down the uh, Orga organic material and they when doing so need to be able to respire so the main things that affect decay are temperature we need a warm environment for um, decay to happen so a warm environment needs to be water is also important if you have a moist environment that promotes decay as well the availability of the oxygen due, due to the need of the uh, microorganisms to respire. So aerated soils are really good for a fast rate of decay and also the number of decaying organi organisms that you have on there, so literally the number of microorganisms that you have to decay the um, organic matter. So questions they might ask about this might be linked to compost bins, for example. So within compost, you've got organic waste that is decaying. So sometimes they are black to absorb the sunlight to keep them warm. You'll see them have holes in them to allow the oxygen and the air to get into uh, the compost bins. They will often have somewhere for the water to get in as well. Not so it's completely waterlogged, but there may be a... Uh, a lid with a few holes in so some moisture can get in for the decaying process. One commercial use of decay comes um, in by the means of anaerobic decay. So normally decay, like we said, happens with oxygen and it will be aerobic, but one commercial use of decay is anaerobic decay because it produces a product called methane gas because of the anaerobic respiration that the microorganisms are carrying out. So anaerobic decay will mean without oxygen and we're trying to use this commercially to produce methane gas which is useful as a fuel. So what we would do is we'd have a chamber um, where we would put into that our organic waste material. So here we have an inlet for our waste material. So it could be animal waste or plant waste that we're putting in here. And out of that becomes our digested material. So in here we would have 
our waste material and our microorganisms in there decaying it in anaerobic conditions and we have a pipe here which we would remove the, all the digested material and this can be used as a fertilizer and put back onto the soils for example and then also you will have a pipe coming out of the top as well for methane gas which is produced during the anaerobic respiration and the anaerobic conditions that are occurring inside the generator and these generators are called biogas generators so we get the gas from the word methane gas that we're being produced and bio is because we were making it from a material that was biological so biogas generator for the decay topic you also need to be aware of a required practical that is a separate only practical to measure the rate of decay we are going to use an enzyme called lipase and that will break down the fats within milk or the lipids within milk. Now the reason why we use enzymes to look at decay is because in the decay process the microorganism will release enzymes and it will be these enzymes that break down the decaying organic matter and then they will absorb again the now soluble molecules and they will use them for growth and repair and everything like that. So they'll secrete enzymes out into the organic matter, the dead plants, materials that they're breaking down, and then they'll be able to absorb the soluble molecules at the end of that process. So by measuring how quickly lipase can break down milk, we can calculate a rate of decay. So in this experiment, we need to use a known volume of lipase, make sure you use the word volume not amount throughout and you can do that by using a measuring cylinder or a pipette and we need to put that in a test tube or a boiling tube. We also need um, milk because that's what the lipase is going to break down, again a known volume of milk, um, a few drops, say five drops of an indicator called phenylphthalein and we need a known amount, in your vision guide it says 7 centimetres cubed, but I'm sure you could get away with just suggesting a sensible amount of sodium carbonate. What this will do, the sodium carbonate is put in there to make the solution alkaline in the first place. They may well ask you what each of these things is used for. This is to make the solution alkaline and it will cause the uh, phenolphthalein to start off pink. So this whole solution that we put in there will be pink to start off with. I don't have pink, so I'll draw in red instead. And what we do with both of these then, we've got our enzyme and our alkaline solution of milk. We will put these in a water bath because what we can do is we can change the temperatures and investigate how temperature affects the rate of decay. So let's say, for example, we started off with our water bath here of 20 degrees C. If we wanted to see how does temperature affect the rate of decay, we'd first of all have to measure a particular volume of our lipase. Um, we can use a pipette for this. So we would take out a small amount of our lipase, let's say one centimetres cubed, and we would put that into our alkaline milk solution and we would use a timer and we would start the stopwatch or our timer and record the time it takes for the solution to go colourless. So you must say the word colourless. So this phenolphthalein was going to start pink and it is going to go colourless and then we can record that in our table. We must make sure that both of these solutions reach 20 degrees so they're at the same temperature um, at the start of the experiment and then we have a time that it's taken to go colourless because we're not measuring a particular volume of gas produced or a particular mass produced over time we can use the calculation rate equals a thousand divided by time and that will just give us a value for rate and the units for that will be per second which you do s to the minus one like that per second then you can change the temperature you can perhaps change this to 30 degrees C and then 40 degrees C and 50 degrees C and so on and you can investigate how the temperature affects the rate of decay. 
One thing I forgot to add, and they may well ask you about, because um, it's often a question that comes up, is when these three are put into uh, the um, test tube, make sure you stir those to make sure it's a proper mixture. And most importantly, when you put the lipase into the mixture, make sure that you stir that as well so it's evenly distributed throughout. For separate science, you need to know a little bit more information about how animals and plants interact with each other um, in terms of trophic levels and biomass. So trophic levels explain where organisms sit within a particular food chain. So trophic level 1 is always drawn at the bottom and then trophic level 2, 3 and 4. And as you know a lot of the energy is lost as you go up a food chain therefore there are normally only 4 or 5 levels within a particular food chain itself. Now trophic level 1, I'll just label the first one, trophic level one is often, uh, and pretty much always actually, plants or algae at the bottom. They um, produce their own en um, food through photosynthesis. They receive energy from the sun and only about 1% of that energy is actually passed on. These plants and algae at the bottom are called producers because they produce their own food in the process of photosynthesis. Level two is always a herbivore um, because that's going to be eating the trophic level one which is the plants and algae and we call this uh, animal the primary consumer because it's the first organism to be consuming another organism so that's the primary consumer. For the trophic level three that is where you will find um, a carnivore For trophic level 3, that's where you'll find a carnivore, because here you've got an animal that will be eating another animal. And we call this one the secondary consumer, because it's the second uh, group of organisms that are eating the primary consumers. And finally, at the top, you will have a, another carnivore, but this time we would call this the tertiary consumer, because this is the third set of consumers. And because this one has no predators, a carnivore with no predators is called an apex predator, which is right at the top of the food chain. In the exam, they might ask you to draw, to scale, a pyramid of biomass, so one that looks a little bit like this. They will always start off with a block that is biggest at the bottom and then gets smaller and smaller and smaller as it goes up. If we break down the word biomass, bio, bio is biological matter, so it is living things, and mass is the mass of it. So it's looking at actually the mass of the different trophic levels as you go up. So if this was, for example, an oak tree, we would here be measuring to scale a particular biomass within the food chain. So for example, if this was a thousand kilograms of oak tree, we would then look up in the next trophic level and by measuring this with a ruler and measuring this with a ruler, we could work out exactly the biomass within this second trophic level. If we measure this for a ruler, for example, and it me measured 10 centimetres, we would know that our scale would be 1 centimetres equals 100 kilograms. So we could then measure this next section, and let's say, for example, this was 5 centimetres showing the biomass of beetles. We could put a value to that and say that the biomass was therefore 500 kilograms. They may well just give you um, the start of the pyramid and ask you to finish it off, or they may well give you a particular value to start with and ask you to draw a scale diagram to show the pyramid of biomass. So we said before that the uh, bottom of the pyramid of bias, biomass will also be the, always be the biggest, and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is to um, reflect the fact that biomass is not all transferred, some of the biomass is lost along the way um, for a number of different reasons really. First of all, at each stage, um, not all of the organism 
is actually eaten. For example, if we look at these beetles here, they may well just be eating the leaves of the tree and not being able to eat things such as bark, for example. So not all of the biomass can be transferred over. Um, perhaps they uh, can't absorb all of what they eat. So they could produce faeces, for example, containing all of the biomass that they can't actually absorb and use within their body. Um, owls and things like that will um, bring up owl pellets containing feathers and bones because they can't absorb that part of their prey or fur and bones if they've eaten something with fur. And finally, the animals themselves will be using some of the biomass themselves um, for things such as respiration, for example. So they're going to use some of that glucose that they obtain from the uh, trophic level below them and they're going to use that to respire and to move. And therefore, some of that biomass is lost or used up along the way. You may well be asked to calculate the efficiency of a... Um, particular uh, step up within the pyramid of biomass and to do that just like all efficiency you'll have little number divided by big number times 100 um, but very specifically it's the biomass of uh, the level that that you're talking about divided by the biomass of the previous level and then times by 100. So if we're doing the efficiency here, we'd have 500 kilograms divided by 1,000 kilograms from the bottom one, multiplied by 100, and then we would have efficiency of 0 0.5, or we can write that as 50%. The final thing that you need to bear, about, bear in mind for um, separate only content as part of this um, interactions between animals and plants um, you don't often see these in the pyramids of biomass, but they might ask you a question in relation to these. And like we touched upon earlier in the decay uh, topic, it's the fact that microorganisms can decompose and decay um, organic matter. So they're called decomposers. So when plants or animals um, die, these microorganisms, for example, bacteria or fungi, will release enzymes into the soil to break down the um, plant or animal material and then the enzymes once they're broken down will make soluble products that are absorbed again by the microorganisms so they will absorb the soluble products that are the products of the enzyme activity. Food security is a global problem that will affect different areas of the world at different times and what food security is, is having enough food to feed a population. So there are several threats to food security for different populations around the world. Um, so in, in some areas it can simply be um, linked to an increasing birth rate. If the numbers of babies um, goes up really quickly and that's not um, in line with the number of people that are dying of old age, then that's going to mean that more people are going to need food and that's going to affect the amount of food that is going to be available for the population. Um, also, changing diet. So changing diets can be um, related to people in developed countries um, deciding to eat very particular foods and therefore um, having those foods tr transported away from areas that really need them. So changing our diets in the developed country can be affecting the food security of other areas around the world. So this could be true for both um, plant crops and also uh, farming. Any new pests or pathogens that are introduced to a population of animals or uh, into a plant crop can therefore affect food security. So if a population is relying on a particular crop and it fails because it's infested by pests, then that's going to be affecting the amount of food that they have to feed the population. Um, environmental change, that could be sudden things or that could be gradually over time, um, perhaps um, linked into global warming. Um, linking into droughts and things like that the populations have that can affect their food security. The costs of 
several different um, things that are needed for agriculture. For example, if the costs of animal feed go up, that can affect the, the farmer's ability to um, farm animals and that will affect the population. Um, it could be in relation to using pesticides and things like that. If they go up, then they might not be able to afford as much to get a good crop of plants, for example. Um, conflicts around the world, so wars around the world, are another major thing that can affect food security. If people are fighting, they may be ruining crops or maybe not be able to access the food and the crops um, due to uh, safety reasons. So that can also affect the food security of a population. In order to ensure food security, the most important thing is that we can produce enough food to feed the population. So what we want to be able to do is to maximise the efficiency of our food production. And to do that, what we need to do is, if we think back to, to trophic levels and uh, pyramids of biomass and how food chains work, we need to restrict the energy transfer from the animals that we are trying to produce to eat to the environment because if we restrict the amount of energy that the animals transfer to the environment that means more can be passed up to the food chain and therefore more will be passed up to us making it much more efficient and the main ways that we can do that is by limiting the movement of the animals so they can be used using less energy through uh, movement and respiration and we can do that by putting them into small enclosures for example um, keeping chickens in, in small sheds rather than letting them roam outside um, in their natural environment and also we can control the temperature that we keep the animals at so they don't have to maintain the temperature themselves for example, normally if they're outside and it's a little bit cold, they would shiver, or if it's a little bit too hot, they would sweat. But by doing those processes, they are going to be uh, using up energy, which we really want to be transferred up the food chain into the consumer. So if we control the temperatures, we would use things such as heaters, indoors, and therefore, although it's costing us money to control the temperature, at the end of the day, it's more efficient as far as food production goes. The main problems with these, if they're in small enclosures and with heaters and things like that, and maintaining those environments, the main disadvantage is because they're close together. There is um, a higher chance of them spreading disease um, between individuals. There are further concerns with um, this method of farming, which we call intensive farming, because although we're trying to, to maximise our food production, um, not only can we transfer disease, but the, the concerns are also um, arisen over the fact that we are pumping our animals with things such as antibiotics, and there's lots of concern about how they are being transferred into the consumer and passed up the food chain. And also for some animals, they are um, fed unnatural diets. So for example, they could be fed a high protein diet. Uh, and protein obviously is related to growth. So if we're feeding lots of protein, that means they'll grow more, they'll produce more food for the consumer. But that can have health implications for the animals as well. One thing that is also affecting food security is overfishing. And because we are taking too many fish out of the sea, the fish populations aren't having a chance to re recover, and in some areas their numbers are declining. So for our fisheries, the government have put down certain quotas um, so that you can only catch a certain amount of different species of fish from different areas. So a quota is a fixed number that they can um, extract from the sea. And also to help with these fish populations, um, to help the, the young survive um, a little bit longer and, and reproduce, they are also putting controls on the net size as well. So previously they may have had a very fine net so they could catch as many fish as, the, as they could, but a lot of the little fish that would have get, got caught in there would have just been wasted because they're not big enough to go to the consumer. So if you control the net size by making it a certain size, so the larger fish that are um, available to go to the consumer because they're big enough to sell and to eat, if they can get through the nets, great. 
and then if all the smaller fish that can potentially go on to reproduce and make and uh, sustain the populations can get through the nets then that will be a good thing overall for the fish populations and the sustainability of fishing. Advances in food production have um, been through the use of biotechnology um, and if you break down the word it's the technology using living things and basically it's manipulating living things to make a useful product. So one of those use useful products is mycoprotein which is a protein used to go in um, corn for example, meat alternatives and this is made by manipulating the fungus fusarium so it's called fusarium and it is a fungus and this is grown in very very large quantities on a glucose syrup so I'll just do it in a petri dish style thing here but this will just be um, massive vats of this industrial um, scale vats where the fungus is grown on glucose syrup in aerobic conditions and it uses the uh, glucose syrup as food and as a result of this it actually produces mycoprotein and that is harvested and purified and then is used to make this meat alternative so when we're looking at food security then if we have a meat shortage for example being able to manipulate this fungus to produce a food source for us on really large scales is a good thing, um, especially as it is high in protein as well. The second big advancement <clears throat> with biotechnology is genetic engineering, which of course can lead to what we term as genetically modified or GM crops. So genetically modified crops are those that have been engineered and changed in some way for example a very famous one is called golden rice and you need to be aware of that one that is a crop of rice that um, had been engineered to produce a chemical that when in the body is converted to vitamin A So that's really useful in countries where they are deficient in vitamin A because um, it means by eating this genetically modified crop they are taking um, vitamin A into their diet. Um, also really important, so that's a specific example that you need to know about, golden rice for vitamin A. Um, also you will have crops of course that are grown to be resistant to pests so that's going to help with food security because it's less chance of your crops getting damaged by pests. Um, you might have a resistance to drought, etc. And to do that, to actually genetically modify them, you have to cut out the gene that you want from a particular organism, could be an animal, plant or a fungus, and you need to put that into the genetic material of your crop. So to do that, you'd use a specific enzyme called a restriction enzyme, and that will cut for you the particular um, gene that you want to be removed, the particular strand of DNA that you want to move. And when it does that, it rec recognises a very particular set of bases, and it will leave it with these two sticky ends, as we call them, either side of the particular gene that you want. So, for example, this could be the gene for drought resistance that you would take from one plant. For example, you might take this from a desert dwelling plant. And you might want to put that into your wheat crop. So, to do that, you'd have your uh, genetic information for your wheat crop. Okay, so you'd have your long strand of DNA and you would use again the restriction enzymes to cut the DNA and again when you do that, that DNA, those DNA strands will have sticky ends which will complement the gene that you are putting in and there's an enzyme that they use to help this gene that you've cut out stick into the new bit of DNA and that is called a ligase enzyme and that helps stick the 
new gene into the existing DNA. So when this gene is inserted, it might look something a little bit like that, if I just try and draw it in there. So we've got our gene now for drought resistance that we've taken from a desert dwelling plant and we have inserted that into our wheat uh, DNA from our wheat crop. And then this new combined piece of DNA is called recombinant DNA, which is a mixture of the existing DNA and a new gene that we have inserted into it. And then we would develop that crop and from that we would then clone that crop so each of the individuals within that population will have this gene here in here for drought resistance.